Let's all stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. President Daly? Here. Vice President Headland? Here. Trustee Clements? Here. Trustee McNall? Here. Trustee Parr? Here. Thank you. Happy New Year to everybody. Um, our next meeting is Tuesday, January 19th, 7 p.m., right here in the auditorium small gym. And um, just for my board colleagues, uh, John will be leading that meeting, and I will not be a here or be available. So we turn the reins over to John. Um, okay, Dr. Benante. Sorry. Sean went I want to lose Sean there. <laughs> Good evening and Happy New Year to everyone. It's great to see you again. I hope you had a restful holiday. Uh, it's been a, uh, a busy return to school this week for, for those of us who are in, uh, on campus. And uh, some great news on, the, um, on one front of our continued management of uh, the uh, COVID uh, response, and that's that we've been able to secure access to rapid testing from the Putnam County Department of Health uh, and rapid tests, uh, and we received those today. So we actually have those in hand now, and you may recall that over the last few months, uh, I think I've spoken several times about the importance of testing long-term, especially as we get into this part of the school year, in being able to effectively manage and navigate um, remaining open if we were able to. And I'm glad uh, now to see uh, that we have those tests in hand. We were anticipating that for about a month now, so um, it's happened. Now, uh, it's a blessing and a curse because the logistics behind facilitating testing is something that we now have to sort through. Uh, there are some districts in our region who are beginning, who have begun to do this, uh, so we have a, a good base to work from, uh, but of course, informing our community um, of what this is going to entail and what this looks like and how we're going to go about it is something that we are going to figure out over these next few days and um, communicate to our community as a whole and take steps to implement now a testing program. And my hope is that we can bridge this gap between January or from January through February, seeing that as probably the most critical juncture uh, because it's a time where we generally have increased illness in the community anyway, whether it be the flu or just common cold. Uh, we uh, can see that certainly the rates of COVID infection are also increasing. Uh, throughout Putnam County right now. And that's consistent with what we're seeing going on, obviously, nationally or reading about nationally. So having access to rapid testing, I do think, will, will really serve uh, two purposes. One um, is a practical one. It will help us establish that our community rate of infection is lower uh, than whatever rate in, of infection we see uh, more broadly. Hopefully, um, that will occur. And two, I, I think that there's a, a high level of anxiety right now that's coming with um, you know, seeing now uh, about another strain of the virus, uh, um, again, seeing the community rate of transmission at a county level continuing to increase. So hopefully this will, uh, I'll say, take the temperature down a little bit uh, as long as the results are what we would anticipate them to be, which is low because that's what's been demonstrated in many other schools as they've implemented testing programs. So uh, that's good news for us. Uh, I'll, I'll have more to report on that two weeks from now as we begin to put a testing program set up um, I do believe that with this, uh, though, that we'll be able to pull this together uh, fairly quickly. It's our, it's our top priority uh, that this will then allow us to open schools uh, as anticipated on um, Monday of next week. Um, and again, physically open our schools to students. Uh, obviously, uh, instruction is being facilitated uh, remotely right now and um, ideally, again, allow us to remain uh, physically open for students uh, over the course of uh, the next two months. Um, I, I, we will have disruptions. I, I think that's unavoidable, but I do think having the testing program in place and other some subtle changes we're going to recommend uh, and make to our process that we're going to communicate tomorrow to our community. Uh, but the most significant one is the notification that we're going to begin to put a testing program in place. So um, with that, I'll pause just to see if there's any questions related to COVID uh, before I proceed. How many tested 
get and will they be continually coming yeah, after, we, you know, after we use them? So right now um, we received uh, 250 tests, which is slightly more than what's needed to test 20% of our uh, student and staff population. Uh, which is a key benchmark that's being used uh, in, uh, by other schools that are implementing testing programs. And it's tied to what the testing requirements were stated to be uh, by the New York State Department of Health should we end up in a designated zone, um, micro cluster zone. Um, so with that, I was just referring back to that document uh, today because while we haven't been designated as a, a micro cluster zone, well, could we implement a testing program that essentially would be consistent with, uh, as if we were, right. um, and, and hold that standard? Because I think there's, I've even expressed concerns about how the zone designations have changed over the last uh, two months. Well, what if we were to just uh, essentially treat ourselves as if we were an orange zone? Because uh, at one point, uh, you know, the, we are beyond whatever at one point that infection rate was, which would be uh, testing about 10% of our students every other week and staff every other week. Um, which with 200 tests, we could do that for the next, uh, over the course of the next uh, two to four weeks. Um, we would then need uh, to replenish the tests that we have. And the Department of Health has indicated to me that if we were to put in an order now, we would likely have those tests replenished in time to continue with a testing regimen uh, that we're beginning to explore. Now, uh, we haven't submitted that order yet. Uh, school districts have to do that directly um, while these tests came from the Department of Health. So there's a process in even requesting the tests that right. uh, we have to go through. So we'll begin to do that in the next uh, day or two. Right, but likely to get them yeah. Is, yeah. is hard. Yep. Um, I, I sat with it uh, prior to yesterday. The issue, uh, Margaret, what, for me was, well, I may have these tests, but if we are designated as a zone uh, two weeks from now, well, I'm going to want to hold on to them until right. such time, right? Because in order to remain open, uh, we have to be facilitating a testing program. So I don't want to use them if it's going to get in my way of uh, right. keeping schools open two weeks from now, like well intended, but that's not going to help us. But um, again, I think we can stagger this in a way where we're testing a cross section of individuals um, on a periodic basis and uh, simultaneously requesting more uh, tests and um, uh, proceeding in that manner. Um, and again, my hope is to bridge this gap for these next two months because if you were to look back historically, these are the next two months where we have the greatest level of uh, illness. Um, if we were to measure that by absenteeism, both for students and for staff uh, in the preceding three years. So um, that's no surprise, right? The winter months usually bring uh, illness in and of itself. Uh, so hopefully this helps mitigate um, uh, or temper, if you will, um, the, the disruptions that we will have uh, over, over these next couple of months. So the plan is to go ahead and start the testing yes. even though we haven't been designated. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and my hope would be to, uh, I think next week would be ambitious, uh, but the week following is likely realistic. Okay. So that would be uh, around Martin Luther King Day um, or the days that follow. Uh, one of the issues we're going to run into is, is when do we do the testing um, specifically and how that's facilitated and whether or not we can have school open uh, while we're doing such. So schools who are implementing testing programs have, uh, you know, every school's different. So their, their level of staffing is different, their uh, level of community. Some uh, schools have community-based health clinics already in the school. Uh, we do not. Uh, so those are all variables that we kind of have to, that we have to sort through to determine when the most appropriate time uh, is for testing. Of course, if you're testing and then someone uh, is uh, test positive, right, you, don't, you want to have a very contained environment where, where you're, you're facilitating testing. So the easiest thing would be to call students down periodically throughout the day, right, and test. But uh, in the event that there's a, someone who's testing, who's asymptomatic but test positive, well now, we have a classroom that had that student uh, inside of it that creates, uh, uh, you know, an issue potentially there. So, you know, my, I'm still 
sitting with that. I have to meet with um, Catherine O'Hara um, uh, and Jenny Shelters tomorrow just to go through, uh, hear their thoughts, Dr. Corsaro, um, our liaison at the Department of Health as we all set this up. So um, there are, there's a lot of, um, as you've heard me say before, a lot of nuance to, to how we go about um, making these decisions um, or examining as we're making these decisions. But uh, this is a good problem to have, I'll say right now, considering everything else going on. And just a quick on the back end of the testing, does the state do the the assessment of whether the tests are like who does the process processing? That's the so the do. test <laughs> is processed right here. These are rapid tests, so yeah. we'll we'll receive a result oh, um, yeah. okay. immediately. Okay. So this will be um, a sit and wait service for families. So okay. um, you know, if you were to bring your child in or children in uh, to be tested. Uh, you would uh, sign a consent form. Yep. Uh, you would provide us with some additional information for our reporting to the state. Um, and then uh, you would have, uh, it's a nasal swab. Uh, the test is then, uh, so it's administered and then it's begun to run. Families would wait likely in their car or some other designated area and we would uh, inform you of the results before you left. Um, uh, the, we are responsible for reporting all positive tests Okay. to New York State, so there's a record-keeping component there uh, that we just have to familiarize our, ourselves with. There is a, a, a state portal, um, a secure portal for, for data entry, again, so there's a clerical component to this. So again, we're, we're essentially running, in, in some ways, a, a, a mini clinic, yeah. uh, and we're subjected to all the rules and the regulations that come with that. Um, so again, we have to make sure we're up to speed on uh, making sure that we're doing this right um, and that we're honoring family uh, privacy uh, as we're doing so. So um, again, the logistics of it are all, all need to be sorted through. And I'm but you got the results immediately. Okay. Uh, that was a silly question. I apologize. No, it's okay. uh, the, and I'm assuming that part of the, the, what you're working through is how, who do we pick and how? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was yeah, going to ask so, the question, like, could you volunteer? And I'm so sure, you could. Like, Some districts, uh, so as Margaret's pointing out, they're referring to that there are requirements for testing when you're in a designated zone. Right. Um, and part of that is a random yep. sampling of students and staff. And you cannot test any um, one individual a second time before you've tested someone a first time. So uh, you have to continually be, let's just say you have a master list, you have to be continually working through and revisiting that master list. When uh, those rules don't necessarily apply when you're doing uh, a uh, an initial oh, testing program that's not necessarily required. But I do think that's a best practice. Yeah. Um, so we want to... Um, ideally set this up as if uh, we were doing it um, like we're going to be we may be required to do it just a few weeks from now um, or it could be a few days from now we don't know um, and, and I think again when trying to convey to the community that our schools are safe um, and that the uh, spread within our schools is low, uh, and again, I'm hopeful that that's what we would see, uh, then that should really be a true cross-section of our school community, um, inclusive of you know, all the various staff that we have and uh, how they're interacting um, with our campus community, as well as a good cross-section of our student body, K-12, as well. So, um, you know, how we facilitate and choose and then uh, is something that we have to think through. But other districts, as they've done their first wave of testing, several have just made it voluntary to start, right. uh, just to get it off the ground, you know. Uh, so the first day or two, they're doing a voluntary um, uh, testing. Um, so we're, we're thinking through what's the best way to set that up. Of course, to do, just to test our process, we're gonna need some volunteers, right? So <laughs> just to make sure we're, because um, we're likely to have to implement some reservation system or something to that extent, because uh, we only have right now um, Ms. Shelters and, and Ms. O'Hara who, who can facilitate the testing. So we wanna get a sense of, well, how long does it actually take to come inside the school, fill out the forms, uh, do a swab, run the test, go back out, notify the family, not that um, Catherine and, and Jenny would be doing that part. Um, so we need to go through this a little bit with our own staff, um, but we'll cross them off the list, right? They've now been tested, and we'll move on uh, or, or get our process ready for, for the next wave. Awesome, good, thank you very much. Yep. I'd imagine you could find some community volunteers. I am sure we would, yes, 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 definitely. Um, anything else on the testing note? 
As I mentioned, uh, there, there will be an update provided to the community tomorrow that includes some other uh, slight changes to our, our process here. Uh, we are making a change to the daily health screener uh, that we want to draw families' attention to and our staff's attention to. Uh, we also uh, do, um, uh, we want to make sure families who have potentially experienced a positive COVID case uh, informally, families have done a good job of notifying of that, uh, us of the, such things. We, we would like to remain attuned to that because uh, it just gives us a help uh, anecdotally to get a sense of how many of our families are, may have been impacted in these previous two uh, weeks uh, while we have been on break. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to mention, this is not in the update, uh, I, I had uh, my weekly call with the Department of Health and the other county superintendents uh, yesterday, and we spoke of the vaccination process, and um, Shanna Siegel, who's our rep with the Department of Health, shared um, just some of her observations and experience for how the facilitation is going not just at a county level, but uh, regionally. And, uh, you know, without getting into elaborate uh, specifics, uh, you know, it was really illustrative of the, uh, the issues uh, and the complexity of a vaccine distribution schedule in the way that it's been designed uh, by New York. And I know there's conflicting, um, you know, there's probably other, other ways to go about it, but also the sensitivity of the vaccination itself and limitations because, um, you know, you, of how it has to be maintained. Um, and and I, uh, it's illustrative and, and it was good to hear, but it also, I had to step back for a minute and say, you know, I. I don't foresee the vaccination making its way to our school staff anytime soon. I was really hopeful that February would maybe be the beginnings of getting our staff vaccinated, but listening to what the Department of Health was sharing yesterday, and obviously we're reading some things in the newspaper as well, uh, that may be a bit ambitious. Hey, if I'm wrong, great. <laughs> but um, you know, I, I did have in the back of my mind this hope that February we would begin to start to see some of our staff uh, becoming vaccinated, and I, I just don't think that's uh, realistic given what I'm hearing and how the vaccine's being distributed. Um, or some of the logistical issues that our uh, local health departments or, or regional hub, which is at Westchester Medical, are encountering. And Shannon made a great point about, you know, our, our regional hospitals have been tasked with uh, the distribution of uh, the vaccination, yet our hospitals right now are the busiest places. So to simultaneously be, I'm sure, you know, uh, prioritizing care, uh, for, you know, all sorts of things that are going on in a, in a hospital, not just uh, COVID-related matters. And then also to facilitate a vaccine distribution plan is, um, you know, I think we can understand uh, well-intended, but uh, given the time of the year right now, pretty, um, it presents its own challenges and obstacles. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Um, but uh, uh, again, we're just going to keep at it, and uh, we've had good success up to this point this school year, I, I think, and I, I think some, some things are coming together right now that we've been working on uh, over the previous three months that are going to be helpful, and we look forward to having our students and staff um, back on, many of our staff are on campus this week, but our students uh, as well on campus uh, next week. Teachers were added to the, to the earlier list, though, weren't they, like within the last couple of days? They were. Anymore. Yeah, so uh, school staff, um, and, and sometimes, um, Margaret, I think recently uh, this, there was a, an initial distribution schedule that referred to phases, and now that has shifted, so excuse me, but uh, school staff were listed in phase, were moved into phase two, which is good, um, but we're still in the early stages of phase one, and phase one um, was a multiple week uh, I think there was one A, one B, one correct. C. Correct. Yes, yes, and that's what was. Uh, um, that's the change I'm noting, and how uh, I believe our school staff are now listed in one C. Yeah, I think they were moved up. Um, whereas initially in the document I viewed it was phase two, but now it's one C. Um, we're still in one A, um, right. and one A has been going on for for some time, and uh, will. So, um, you know, that's uh, that's part of the um, part of the issue attached to that is. The vaccine is being distributed to hospitals, but also at times to um, departments of, Department of Health, respectively. Um, and then at other times, other health-based, other clinics. Mm -hmm. So 
each of whom have unequal information on how to contact the groups that have been designated as, not to get too far in the weeds right. on this, but who have been designated as eligible for the vaccination. So you can imagine the Department of Health has access to a different level of information than a regional, than Westchester Medical is going to have. Uh, yet Westchester Medical serves as the regional hub for however many counties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're working with uh, primary um, or first responders that some of whom work on a county level, some of whom work on a state level some of whom work on a, on a local level. So, uh, right. you know, again, this was just some of what we were getting into yesterday that, that um, illustrates the logistical challenges with trying to even notify those who may be eligible for a right. vaccination when they have them. Uh, and of course, Nate, you've read about the restrictions uh, that are tied to the distribution and the penalties for distributing to those who aren't on. So. <laughs> Uh, you're reading now these stories about, you know, an entity that may have a thousand doses, but can only get 600 people to commit, and then they have 400 doses, but they're not able to administer them to anybody because you can't do an all call, um, you know, for anybody who may want to come in and get one of the remaining doses, you, you're limited to mm -hmm. the groups that are on the schedule. So, um, again, these were all the things we were discussing right. yesterday that uh, just uh, give me a bit pause uh, in thinking that. Uh, we're going to be able to get to 1C quickly. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Okay. Bill? Yes? Is it, is it possible that our, here we go, is it possible that our, our, uh, our school nurses will be able to access the vaccine since they're healthcare workers? And uh, I'm just curious to know. Yes, uh, our school, that's a great question, Sean. Our school nurses were notified this week uh, that they do have uh, and are eligible for the vaccine. Um, and uh, I know um, Catherine and, and Jenny specifically were notified uh, that they are eligible and the specific location where they could go to uh, to be vaccinated if that was something that they uh, chose to do. Great. So that's good news for them. <laughs> and us? Yes, and for us as well. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? More questions? COVID update questions? Thank you, Dr. Benante. Thank you. So you'll you'll see more from that uh, from me through our more formal channels in the in the days to come as we begin to set that up. And I, Jenna, I'm just reminded I, I wanted to mention that uh, you know at these kind of strategic turning points, uh, we are reconvening the school reopening task force core team, uh, our leadership team that uh, worked through the summer to um, sit with this information no different than you are right now. So we scheduled that meeting for Friday uh, where we have our PTA leadership, our liaison, uh, Judy with the, uh, with the town, Judy Farrell, um, as well as um, uh, our union leadership internally. Um, so just to give, uh, create our own space to uh, talk through uh, some of these uh, matters internally and with our, uh, some of our community partners. So I just wanted to mention that we're continuing to utilize that structure that we set up at the start of the school year. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Budget time. Yeah, so we have a brief budget presentation for this evening, and uh, I did provide you with a copy of the presentation uh, just as we begin to reorder ourselves. I didn't, I didn't know if everybody would have their laptops tonight, and I didn't mention to bring it. Um, and some of the cells, when we get into our spreadsheets, are a little hard to see. So uh, that's for your use, and uh, we'll pull the presentation up here for Cecilia's recording. And uh, Peggy, I'm just going to slide over to that seat, uh, if you don't mind, so I can... Um, Sean, are you, are you up there? Do you have the uh, video? Can you see it? Which one, Ann? B? Thank you. Jen, do you want me to hold the, does he need to see the? You know what happens is that the, there's too much glare. Oh. So he doesn't actually, he can't actually see it. And usually, I, I forgot to bring my little phone holder. Well, what if you want to put it on, like, So now here? I'm just going to have him look at Phil. <laughs> we were trying to have him watch the live stream. Oh. But it's not quite working. Okay. So as we go through this evening's presentation, as I mentioned it, uh, following the, we're following the process uh, that we've followed in previous years. 
Uh, some of which is required by law, um, which is uh, in, in part of tonight's is, which is to present the beginning of the administrative and capital components of the budget, as well as what we anticipate um, as uh, the prop a second proposition, which would be included in May's um, uh, in May's budget vote. And as a as a starting point, as you're aware, before we have state aid figures from New York State, we usually are just providing an overview of the admin and capital components up to this point, um, our actual spending in previous years, and what we have budgeted for this school year, and what we're beginning to anticipate as our projected final cost for this school year. Uh, as we discussed uh, last month, uh, we are moving away from the rollover budget uh, column, which you would have seen in previous years, uh, because we believe that the information uh, that we get really in these in the next month or two uh, are more uh, helpful to us in our actual budget planning uh, and finalizing those figures. So in lieu of providing um, just a rollover amount, uh, we're going to provide you with what we believe, uh, where we believe we will come in uh, this school year, and then use those figures as a basis of the budgeting process that we're now in internally uh, as we finalize the educational plan and budget to present to you in March. Okay. And the uh, a move that we had made, I believe, two years ago was to not just uh, enter into these uh, presentations as if we're informing the board, because the board has a high level of uh, background experience now with budget development, uh, but to also organize this, uh, these documents in a way that any community member who may um, at any point decide to go in and want to learn more about the budget development process, that they contain the necessary amount of information for a community member to do so. Um, so on this first page, you'll see uh, just an overview of some of the key categories and what those categories include uh, within the budget line items. So um, I'll give you a moment just to look through these on, on your uh, 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 on your paper or slide deck here. Um, to reorient yourselves. This is so great because every year, even though we know what, that the Board of Education isn't getting paid the right. 40 grand or whatever the line item is, I always make sure to ask, Anne, could you tell yes. the public? Yeah. So, so that's the... Uh, I appreciate the definitions. I think that that's uh, helpful. And as we get into this next figure, uh, and I understand it may not be hard to see on our screen here, so that's why you have it in front of you. Uh, you can refer back to the definitions if needed. So I'll give you a, a moment just to digest uh, the figures that we're showing here. Uh, we're looking back three years on the actual spending in each of these areas what we budgeted for 2021, which is the year we're currently in, and what we anticipate as our projected costs by the conclusion of this school year. So coming in under on basically everything except instructional, instructional administration. Correct. Okay. And if you have any key figures that you want to discuss or if you see a shift in a particular area. And again, there's only two, um, uh, two decks, if you will, that we're going to be providing this evening with figures on them. Uh, Ann and I went through all of these uh, <laughs> over the last two days just to make sure we were ready to explain any significant variance that you see from budgeted to projected or from one year to the next if you're wondering why, you know, in 1819 we spent in a certain area and uh, why we saw an increase or a decrease in, in the years that followed, we, we should be able to explain those to you this evening. Just uh, while we're on it, what, what's the projected decrease on the, uh, the projected increase or over budget on instructional and admin? And do you want to come up to the microphone just so we can get it? Would you repeat that, please? That's okay. Um, on uh, budget, 2021 budget to 2021 projected on the instructional administration line. That seems to be the only one that's up. Everything else is down, which is lovely that we're coming in under under 
budget and saving saving some over time. Any detail on that that's that's able to share in public? Right. Those are um, from. Let me see. Let me check this. I have my own legend on my notes here, so. <laughs> So from the 2021 budget to the projected um, instructional administration also includes professional development. Yep. So there okay. were some increases this year because we um, there were some things, if you look um, up in the Board of Education line and the staff line where we're under, those are under in the BOCES category. Okay. And there was a shift so that we were able to do some more things with professional development in, um, on the instructional administration line. Okay, got it. So is it, and obviously this is a year when we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing for Right, there, <laughs> there's a lot on. of opportunity out there at this time for a lot okay. of online. Um, there's just every day that you look there, the list gets longer of what's available, um, different yeah. opportunities for instruction. Great, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And the, the increase um, from 1819 to 1920 on the Board of Education line is about $10,000. Should I assume that's because of the mail-in, the, the um, budget vote? The Board of Education line. Yeah. There was a um, very large increase in the district meeting in, in um, facilitating that. Yeah. Also included in that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, was the demographic study that oh, was done okay. that year, and that would be coded under the Board of Education function. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we include at the, the bottom, just uh, for community reference more so than anything, what percentage of the total budget that the, um, these components uh, comprise. So uh, $2.8 million in total, we have a $25 million budget. It equates to roughly 11% gotcha. of the total budget. Should we move on to capital? Yes. Thank okay. You. So again, this is an overview of each of the um, functions within the capital component of the budget. And then you'll see the expenditure. So this is a the budget protection for the budget to projected for operations and maintenance. That's a lot of that's COVID cleaning infrastructure. If if we're buying shielding, is that in there? Okay. Yes, it yep. is. Yep. All those that sort all, of, all of the yeah. supplies and materials and um, I guess renovations that we had to do, whether they're stickers or on the floor or yep. um, signs or. Um, the plexiglass. Okay. That's and all. Will any of that money come back through FEMA grants or anything? Uh, not as of yet. We, we do <laughs> no, not. No, but, but we'll put in for it. Is that is that projected that the if schools will get If we're given the opportunity to submit expenditures, we have those all separated so that we identify them. So there's a chance that number will come down. There's a chance. That's <laughs> a very slim. <laughs> <chance>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't sense a lot of hope. Hope no. springs eternal. And I assume that, <laughs> like, um, from, from the actual to the, but from the actual last year to the budget this year, we, you obviously increased it significantly. Part of that was in anticipation of this to begin with, right? 
Right, so if there was another column there that showed budget for 1920, yep. it would be somewhere between the actual and the actual of 1920 and the budget for 2021. What okay. happened is we came under for 1920 yep. because it, we weren't open, so the right. operating expenses were less. And that got shifted into 2021 uh, because okay. of all of the extra things that we had to do. Got it. So we were under budget for 1920, which you're not seeing the budget figure there. But we're over for 2021. But remember, it's because yep. we brought that those it's funds fun. forward. And I'll I'll go way back in history. Any like interfund transfers in 1718. <laughs> I know that a lot of it is ends up being school lunch, and we do. But were we doing something different that year? For interfund transfers for seventeen eighteen. Do you know? Um, that is, we had some fund balance that we sent um, some to the capital fund. Um, if you notice, you go one line up for debt service, and yep. you see the big jump in debt service? Yeah. That was the year that we... Um, use the land sale reserve fund. We brought that in from the reserve fund because we paid down a bond anticipation note for the turf field. Okay. It was in its fifth year, so we bonded. Yep. And so that money had to be brought into the general fund from yep. the reserve fund. Okay. And um, so the year before, we were funding um, the reserve not just the land sale reserve, but the capital reserve. Okay. And um, that's a transfer out. Okay. okay, got it. Cool. Okay. And uh, as every year we examine our vehicles and the need to replace certain vehicles, and you're familiar with the schedule that we're typically on, uh, with this, we do uh, anticipate replacing one uh, school bus or propose making, a, including a second proposition, which would include the replacement of one school bus uh, and two minivans uh, this, uh, for next school year. And I believe our, our board, uh, but for any community member who may be watching, is familiar with the uh, debt schedule and how we finance this. These tend to be. Uh, tax neutral or very close to tax neutral propositions, but allow our, our fleet to stay up to date. Um, so that that's something we anticipate including. Remind me how big how big is our fleet ish? We have six minivans, one car. I think we have. Um, we have, I, I don't know what the breakdown is, but between the large buses and the medium yellow vans, yeah. which is not what we're talking about here, it's 18. Okay, okay. These, uh, the minivans that we're proposing to um, replace this up and coming year are the, the small five passenger. Okay. We're about 200,000 miles on them. We get so much mileage out of them and save a lot on fuel. Yeah. Um, and then next year, we, Tim and I developed a three-year plan okay. for the next three years. We uh, know what we're going to be asking for for the vehicle propositions. Um, it's heavy on the minivans because they're, they get so much use. Oh, yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I saw one going out this morning. Actually, which raises the question, why did we have a, a bus go out this morning? Uh, we're still, uh, so there could be for one of uh, a couple of reasons, we're still doing meal service. Um, okay. So there's oh, potential okay. we were uh, providing meals uh, to a family, um, just okay. trying to think of vehicle. But we also are responsible for still transporting some special needs students oh, got it, got it. Uh, to their um, particular schools. Those schools may be in session and got we're it. still providing that. Got it, makes sense. And those buses, I don't. I mean, I don't know if this was the case, but we also, there's also 
I mean, at least in the past, we're also, we've also blessed students who um, attend private schools within yes. a particular range, yes. it's, which is why, because it sounds like a, a lot of vehicles for a small district, yeah. but I think it's, this is an opportunity to remind the public that it's not just bringing students back and forth to Haldane, it's students that go to BOCES, special needs students Correct. who go to out of, you know, out of district placements, and then our multiple responsibilities to bus um, uh, families uh, who send their children to private school, Correct. but the private schools within a particular Correct. range. That that that's, remains Correct. our responsibility. Right. And I believe the range for private schools is is it thirty miles? Or? Uh, I, I don't know. I, didn't mean I to don't remember. Like trivial, Sorry. trivial pursuit of school board. <laughs> 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 who knows? <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. That still be an acronym. I think it. <laughs> but we also has to have to have a couple of spares because some yeah. get taken yeah. out of service for inspection or if they're down for a repair. So and sports, we do have to and, yeah. take mm -hmm. care of those. Or the, not just sports, but all extracurricular activities. It's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. yeah. In some sort of way. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Benante. Yeah, so I think the next presentation uh, is scheduled to be special education, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. uh, will be our next presentation, uh, budget presentation, okay. um, which is a, a you know, a, a slightly um, uh, different in the way it's constructed, obviously. Um, so Tara will be prepared uh, to provide that overview for the board at our, our next budget workshop. That's always tricky timing-wise, though, because don't you guys do like, I don't know what they're called, the reviews or? Annual reviews. The, is that what it is? The yeah. annual reviews where you decide what kids might need next Correct. year, but you don't do that till later Correct. in the so budgeting process. It's probably one of the more complicated components of the budget development process and the most, uh, where we're working most with projections because the annual, view, annual review process will go all the way up uh, until June. So as you know, right. we've already voted on a budget by that time. So. Uh, for the most part, the majority of our students uh, with uh, special needs, uh, we can anticipate the level of support that's going to be required year over year. It doesn't typically dramatically mm -hmm. shift uh, from one year to the next, but what, uh, especially in a, in, a, in a smaller school district, the com the, I, I think it's more complicated. Uh, in a big district, things kind of tend to level out over the course of mm -hmm. uh, you know, what could be hundreds or uh, up to a thousand students that um, have such services, but uh, in our district, you know, we could have one student who's placed in an out-of-district placement mm -hmm. uh, at a significant cost that could really be the equivalent of a, a full-time teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we try to um, anticipate and, and facilitate those annual reviews first. Um, so we're aware of that, going as, as aware as we can be in the budget development process. Uh, but for a variety of factors, those meetings sometimes don't occur until later and, and can um, uh, get in the way um, or end up with a dramatically different figure than what we may have presented to the board in January or February uh, as compared to where we are uh, realize, or what we're realizing in uh, June. And, and quite frankly, an annual review could occur in July and August as well. You could have a student move into the district right. Right. Um, as well. So, um, so yes, of, of all the presentations you will uh, have, that one is, the, is probably one that's a, a can be, I, I hesitate to use the word speculative, <laughs> but um, we are trying to be very deliberate with how we, how we project um, uh, those, uh, those uh, needs or, and, and what the costs will be. Mm -hmm. And remind me, the, there was not a special reserve established for, for that. That was a potential, but it did not happen, right? By, by law, it was not enabled, and therefore we didn't get it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, is there any communication from the public at this time? No. Our wellness committee minutes from December 14th are here for uh, review. Information reports are also here for review. And we're going into consent agenda minutes. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. These are the minutes from December 15th. That seems like a million years ago. Um, any questions, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Consent agenda financial. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I have a, I have a just a quick question. It's something just I didn't notice until today when I was looking at it again. Um, and it could be one of those trivia questions. Mm -hmm. on, on the list, there's a couple of things in the budget transfer that you say it says not required under approval status. What is our amount that is required? I thought it was 10,000 that it, it required board approval for budget transfer. What's the, what's the number? It says not required under approval status. In the November report? Mark? In the November report. And it, it's stuff we would approve. It's the, you know, the extension of the athletic director because we didn't get a new athletic director. But under approval status, it says, it says not required. And one of them is 10, 10,000, which I thought was the number, but one is 12 and one is 15. Conversation about it is thirty thousand. Is thirty? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, I'm not picturing um, the document that you're looking at. I have I it open. Do you want to look? Uh, if you don't mind me coming. No, nope, not at all. complete sense it's 30 but I think that that not required um, means that we don't require that field to be filled in oh see it says it under approval status right I thought it meant board board approval not required now this is a budget transfer schedule and we could use that column for that if we want but it's not on all of them See, some of them don't have it. But that's part of number 728. So if you would have that, go back up if you would, please. See, 728 says not required there. It's not going to list it for the whole thing. because this It's is only going to be listed for the individual right. one. So that column isn't required. That doesn't have anything to do with the board approving it. Correct. Got it. Because you are approving it when you look at the board really approving everything when you look at the budget transfer. Right, the right. So it's, but it doesn't have to do with that the 10 or 15,000 numbers. Threshold. No, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Um, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent agenda personnel. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, old business, our mid-year self-evaluation. This is just here for John to remind us of what we're doing. Thank you very much, and remind me to send, up, to send everybody the content. So <laughs> we are um, uh, self-assessing on the, on the key five standards. I can never remember the standards versus the um, uh, protocols. What's the other one? Standards. No, but the five standards, and then there, there are five, under each standard, there are five action items uh -huh, or five uh -huh, objectives uh -huh. or something. Um, you did, I did not send it out, so I owe it to everyone. We're going to do that over the course of the next couple weeks because Jen is out next time, and we're going to reconvene on February, the first meeting in February, to, sh to do a top line review of what, we, of what you suggested to me. So. The standards are the buckets, and the practices, practices are what's in the buckets. So we're only doing it at the standard level. The standard level. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you're going to send the board an email. I'll send it to you as soon as I get home. And is there any sort of deadline that you would like? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, new business, the CSC CPSC placement recommendations. Ms. Platt. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Board of Education hereby approves the recommendations of the Committees on Special Education and Preschool Special Education as presented. May I have a motion, please? So moved. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 The approval of the Memorandum of Agreement between the Board of Education and the CSEA. Ms. Platt. Be it resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, 
The Board of Education hereby approves the supplemental memorandum of agreement between the Haldane Board of Education and the Civil Service Employees Association dated January 5th, 2021, related to furloughs during the pendency of the COVID-19 pandemic state of emergency and authorizes the superintendent to sign the agreement on behalf of the district. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Dr. Benante, do you wanna? Yeah, I, I alluded to this, I, I believe, during our December meeting that we were uh, perhaps entering into a period of time where uh, when students are not in session, that it doesn't necessitate uh, that we had employees whose titles are dependent or tied to students being in school each day, uh, and that we'd be seeking uh, their approval uh, to utilize some of those unit members in other capacities that are outside of their title. Um, our CSEA uh, was uh, wonderful to work with on this in resolving it, and um, uh, I think of mutual benefit. Uh, we don't have to go into a position of considering furloughing employees and I think the boards uh, with the boards trust that uh, we have meaningful work uh, to keep uh, individuals um, uh, engaged during uh, such times that we've been in for the uh, last week or are in this week and uh, the preceding days prior to the holiday break and in case we come upon it such a time again uh, in, the, in the weeks or months to come uh, we know we have that flexibility and I think that's a great thing. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Walsh was visibly excited to have some extra hands. <laughs> I'll tell you, Mr. Walsh has quite the list of projects that he uh, has prepared to work really through, like... so everybody's been very busy. <laughs> okay, any... and it's great, okay. but it's great we can have that and, and you know, can, can do that, because yeah. so many districts are just so strapped yeah. Yeah. that, you know, we, we really, like, it's hard, but we are, I can't get over how fortunate a lot, we, of, we are. a lot of things, and I, I still, with something like this, go back as well to decisions that bo the board made and the community made to support our budget last yeah. school year, you know, as Ann was referring uh, to in, in one of the figures on our budget presentation where, we're, of course, we're spending more in maintenance and operation right now to keep our schools clean and to go through advanced protocols for such. So it all, I think it all ties together. Um, and, uh, but no, thank you, Peggy. I, I think... Um, you know, noting that is important. It, it, we are very fortunate, um, uh, absolutely. And you see what else is uh, occurring in other communities. Um, okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any communication from the public? No. Please, Anne. The, the mileage limits are Fifteen. Fifteen. Thank you. <laughs> There you go. It's See? She found a friend. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think it was 30. 15 uh, no. miles from And it said Lords is right on the end of it. And I'm like, how far is Lords from here? It's got to be 15. But I'm 30, and Lords isn't that far from me. So <laughs> it's the way the crow flies. <laughs> um, any board reflections? Any superintendent final thoughts? No, it's great to see everyone again. Happy New Year. And no further thoughts. Thank you, Jen. Okay, and then I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. May I have a second, please? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.